Welcome to the America's 360 podcast. Get the inside scoop and the outside perspective on the latest developments from Canada, Latin America, and everywhere in between. America's 360 is a production of the Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars. Welcome to America's 360. I'm your host, John Molesky. This program is brought to you by the world's number one think tank for regional studies, America's 360 is a collaboration among the Wilson Center's Argentina Project, Brazil Institute, Canada Institute, Latin American Program, and Mexico Institute. On January 6th, the day the U.S. Congress met to certify President-elect Joe Biden's electoral college victory, a pro-Trump protest turned violent, overwhelming security, breaching and attacking the U.S. Capitol building in Washington, D.C. As these shocking events unfolded, the eyes of the world were on the United States and on the state of its democracy. In this episode of America's 360, we'll take a look at perceptions from the Americas about the riot on Capitol Hill. What are other countries saying? And what are the implications for the U.S.'s image and standing? These are just some of the questions our roundtable will explore, and our regulars will have help from a number of special guests, a group of journalists from news organizations in Mexico, Brazil, Argentina, and Colombia. So let's welcome back the America 360's roundtable. Please say hello to Argentina Project Director Benjamin Gaudet. Hey, John. How are you, John? Hey, Benjamin. Welcome back. Also, Brazil Institute Director Ricardo Zuniga. Hi, John. Hey, Ricardo. Latin American Program Director Cindy Arnson. Hey, John. Happy New Year. Hi, Cindy. Thank you. Happy New Year to you as well. And Mexico Institute Director Duncan Wood, who will be moderating today's roundtable and introducing our special guests. Hey, Duncan. Hey, John. Thanks very much. So okay. it's all, uh, all up to you, Duncan. I appreciate that. Uh, John, thanks for, for introducing today's session. And, uh, you know, as you mentioned, we've got four uh, very special guests with us today. Um, outstanding journalists from the region who are present uh, uh, here in the United States and elsewhere. And uh, I'd like to introduce them one by one. Uh, a very good friend of the, of the Mexico Institute, uh, Jose Diaz Briseño, who is the Washington correspondent of Mexico's Reforma newspaper. Good afternoon, Jose. Thank you for the invite, Duncan. Thank you. Great to have you. Uh, Paula de Orte, a correspondent in D.C. for Brazil's O Globo newspaper. Hi, Paula. Hi, thank you for inviting me, Duncan. Great to have you. Rafael Matos Ruiz, U.S. correspondent for Argentina's La Nación. Hey, Duncan. Good to be with you. Thanks for being here, Rafa. And Alejandro Santos, former director of Columbia Semana magazine. Alejandro. Hello, Duncan. Thank you for having me. Well, they're here to give us a look into the regional perceptions of last week's uh, events. And uh, I think what I'd like to begin with is just to uh, sort of, you know, I'm a foreigner here in the United States myself. And I think that last week's event showed an image of the US that really shocked people here and around the world. And I'd like to ask each of you, um, you know, how have, uh, have people, the government, uh, society, social media, reacted to last week's events. And let's begin with you, uh, Jose, if you don't mind talking about the Mexican case, because it's particularly fascinating, because we have, of course, have a president there who has a rather complicated relationship with uh, President Trump and with President-elect Biden. But why don't you give us your take on the Mexican reaction to last week's events? I guess just like everywhere else around the world and also here in America, the events of last week were shocking in general terms, all newspapers in Mexico and all TV stations covered the events, whether with a correspondent or uh, from uh, or remotely. And even tabloids in Mexico carried uh, the storming of the capital the next day in their front pages. That speaks to you about how widely known this event went in Mexican society. Now, let's let's say obviously among Mexican intelligentsia. Uh, this was shocking both because of political and also visually uh, because uh, the fact that the, one of the seats of power in the U.S. has been breached and attacked uh, is, is just extraordinary. It's also been seen as the culmination of all uh, the extreme voices that uh, Trump has unleashed during his presidency. And the big question, just like I guess uh, everywhere else, is how come a professional police department like the Capitol Police uh, allow this to happen. I think that little by little in the past few days we've learned a lot about it, but still uh, it's a question that it's in the people's minds. Uh, another thing, as you were mentioning, Duncan, is the relationship between AMLO and Trump. Suddenly, uh, because of 
and the supposedly or allegedly non-interventionist foreign policy, he didn't comment directly on the events on, uh, on, uh, around the capital. But right away, the moment that uh, the so social media platforms started to uh, be about Trump and suspend him from, uh, from uh, participating, AMLO came to the defense of uh, Trump unwittingly saying that he didn't like uh, censorship. Uh, obviously, uh, by not taking a position, uh, AMLO was taking a position in favor of a guy who has supported him, even in the most extreme of circumstances, just because of him uh, uh, helping with the migration containment from uh, the cent Central American migrants. Alejandro, I'd like to ask you about the, the reaction in Colombia. Colombia and the United States historically have been very strong allies. In fact, Colombia is probably the U.S., uh, the United States' most important ally in South America. And at the same time, Colombia is a country that has experienced uh, political as well as criminal violence, um, violent armed groups, um, as well as political polarization. So tell us a little bit about how all of these um, events in the U.S. were perceived um, in Colombia. Yes, Cynthia, I think uh, we are, as a citizen and Latin American, very shocked about what happened in the, in the last uh, few days in, in the United States, the, the first democracy in the world, the most powerful democracy. And to see the, a chapter uh, more like a, a banana republic than, than this strong democracy was uh, really scared, scared for a democracy who for most uh, politicians and citizens are, is dying in the world, in the Western world. And these images that we saw and the, and the mob uh, entering the Capitol Hill was very symbolic of this crisis of the democracy. So we asked ourselves, what is it going to happen? And where are we uh, going in, in the next, uh, in the future, no? And behind that, uh, it's important to, to say that Colombia was in the central, central stage of the political campaign because of the importance of the borders, the Colombian borders in Florida, a crucial state in the campaign, more than 200,000 voters, and accusation against the, 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 the government party that was supporting the Trump campaign. And that was uh, now the, the debate in the political arena in Colombia is if these uh, uh, actions by the governing party, the uh, Centro Democratico in Colombia, is putting it in jeopardize the departing support of the United States uh, 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 in, in the in the fight against the, the drug trafficking and and, and, and the, the support of the United States to Colombia and you know as, as you said Colombia is one of the best allies of uh, of the United States in the hemisphere so uh, the question is how the Biden administration is going to respond in the in the few months uh, by this episode. Uh, of, of accusation against the government party uh, for supporting the Trump campaign. So that's, uh, in Colombia, the, the big uh, question mark for, uh, for the days uh, ahead. Well, that's actually, that's a very interesting point, Alejandro. And Paula, turning to Brazil, there's actually a real close correlation there as well, particularly given the identification between President Bolsonaro and President Trump and their whole worldview. Uh, how are the events in, in Washington interpreted in terms of that relationship and the implications for the United States and Brazil going forward into a Biden administration? Yeah, so it was certainly a shocking day for everyone here in America and for everyone back home as well. The newspaper that I work for had on its cover as its main title the next day, Trump incites attack to democracy and mob invites U.S. Congress. And other newspapers had attack to democracy on their covers. And uh, actually, other Brazilian newspapers uh, had the words like shame, frightening, and chaos on their covers as well. So it was a day where everyone on social media in Brazil was talking about what was happening uh, at the Capitol. 
And at the same time that people were making comments about, as um, uh, as you've mentioned, uh, Banana Republic or things like that, also you could feel that people were anxious and worried because, as you've mentioned, um, President Bolsonaro has a cl close relationship with President Trump. They, they've uh, been together many times. And uh, he has said uh, after the events at the Capitol that the same thing would happen in Brazil during the 2022 elections if we didn't have print votes in Brazil. The discussion about print voting in Brazil is similar to the discussion about mail-in voting here in the U.S., so um, actually, uh, he was trying to convey the idea that we would have chaos in Brazil uh, due to our election system, which is um, something that could uh, make people anxious because our electoral system has uh, been working uh, well during the last 30 years. So uh, we also had our foreign minister, Nestor Araujo, has uh, mentioned in his Twitter account that there could be some undercover agents during the invasion of the capital. So there was this impression that the Brazilian government was uh, still supporting President Trump in its narrative as regards uh, what happened uh, in the election. So at the same time that people were talking about how the U.S. used to be uh, a role for democracies around the world and how we used to look to the U.S. and now this is happening and kind of this feeling of uh, looking at it like uh, see now Americans now you are the ones that are trying that have to deal with with a mess like us we had to do before at the same time people felt very anxious and there was a lot of apprehension especially because polarization in brazil is very is a very big problem as well and there's all of this discussion about the next election for for us Claire, speaking of you know high levels of social and political polarization in brazil I've been hearing over the last few days a lot of comparisons to Argentina's political transition about four years ago, five years ago now, when then-president Cristina Fernandez de Kirchner opted not to participate in the swearing-in of her successor, Mauricio Macri. Now, there was no violence at the time. She didn't contest the results of the election. And in fact, four years later, when Mauricio Macri, the incumbent, lost in a you know, relatively close election, he accepted the results right away, met with Alberto Fernandez, attended the swearing in. I guess my question is, what, if anything, does Argentina have to offer the United States regarding elections in a context of high political polarization? Yes, Benjamin, exactly. Like you were saying, you know, ever since democracy returned to Argentina in 1983, all presidential transitions have been somewhat traumatic. You know, Raul Alfonsín had to leave power early. Fernando de la Rúa also quit uh, before the end of his term and left Casa Rosada, famously flying in a helicopter, you know, and then opened what is known now as the week of five presidents. Uh, the transition between Nestor and Cristina Kirchner was, of course, very seamless. But then in 2015, as you were saying, Cristina Kirchner lost the election. Actually, his uh, ally, Daniel Soli, lost the election against Mauricio Macri. And she, you know, acknowledged defeat, unlike Trump, who hasn't acknowledged defeat to Joe Biden. But that transition was very traumatic because there was a lot of discussions about the protocol and how it was going to happen. And in the end, Christina refused to attend the um, ceremony in which Mauricio Macri uh, was thrown in. But, you know, that aside, it was somewhat, and I never thought I was going to say, the much better transition than what we're seeing now in the U.S. with the president who is refusing to acknowledge defeat, still denouncing and a massive fraud that has been debunked by the courts, by the states, by Congress, and with the very shocking events that we saw last week here in D.C., which, you know, as you know, Paola and Pepe were saying, they were uh, widely covered as well in, in Argentina, and, you know, people were completely shocked. And, of course, you know, we Argentines are known for make everything about ourselves, so social media were uh, very quickly filled with, you know, scathing remarks comparing what happened here in Congress to, you know, the funeral of Diego Armando Maradona, which caused an explosion, implosion of people inside Casa Rosada. 
for some of the revolts that we've had in Congress with the crisis in 2001. Um, as you were saying, Benjamin, both the US and Argentina are very, very polarized societies. And I think as long as you have political parties who are willing to play the politics of La Grieta, who are willing to you know, profit and try to take some advantage from polarization, polarization will remain and will deepen. But I think the biggest challenge that Joe Biden faces in his uh, upcoming administration and his government is to try to you know, fulfill his promise of healing a nation. Uh, I, I think it's a very, very difficult goal that he has set for his administration. And, you know, in, Ar in, in Argentina, you know, Alberto Fernandez, Sergio Massa, some both political figures, main political figures of the ruling coalition, El Frente de Todos, they both promised to, you know, stop dividing the country, stop polarizing the country, stop feeding and, you know, uh, making La Grieta even more deep. But ever since they got into power, that's exactly what they've done. Mauricio Macri, also he said that he was going to unite the country and he didn't. He played the politics of polarization. So as long as the political parties see a, a benefits that you know are larger than the benefits of trying to unite the country, I'm afraid that polarization is going to continue and it's going to mark the political um, time that we face in the future. Thanks to all of our, our panelists and, and guests for, for their comments here. I find it fascinating that in addition to the sense of shock that people have felt, that there is this um, ability or capacity uh, throughout the region to identify with what has been taking place in the United States. Um, and, uh, you know, I want to point out that we've been joined by our dear colleague, Chris Sands, director of the Canada Institute. Uh, Chris, you, you, you came in a little bit late, so... Uh, We've, we've saved the best, uh, the best moment whilst everybody's warmed up for you to come in here. So uh, why don't you uh, share a, a question or some comments with the, with the audience? Well, yeah, for sure. And it's been a fascinating discussion. I did catch most of it. And um, I, I guess I'd like to ask um, our guests the question that I think uh, has troubled a lot of the Canadians as well. President-elect Biden responding to the, the rioters, you know, said this isn't who we are. This, this isn't America. This is, this is sort of an aberration. I wonder. Um, and I know a lot of Canadians are wondering, is that true or is that just what we wish was true? Do you see the the Trumpist moment as part of who the U.S. is now? Or do you see it as as something that hopefully will go back uh, under under a Biden administration to the U.S. that everyone knows and some love? Um, maybe, Paula, could you maybe start with that? So I, I, I do believe that although there always uh, was an underlying sentiment of anti-Americanism among certain populations in Latin America, there was also great admiration for the United States, for its democracy, for its democratic system. And when people talk about what happened during the last few days now, uh, at the same time that maybe there is a little bit of uh, uh, feeling as now the U.S. is seeing what we've been through, there's also a lot of anxiety, of uncertainty. Um, people don't want the U.S. to go through uh, a democratic crisis because it feels other countries where maybe the democracy is not that well established feel more insecure, feel like, well, who are we going to look for? Who are we going to look at? So there are this contradictory uh, sentiments towards what happened. Uh, I was there myself on the day where I was reporting on the ground and it was a very odd feeling because as I was walking towards the Capitol, uh, there were so many people that were uh, walking there and I couldn't look at, uh, I couldn't find exactly who were the people that I could look for if I had to to ask for help if something happened because I couldn't identify the police and then later I found out that the police were guard, guarding the, the building. And so it felt, for me as a journalist, as a reporter, it felt uh, very tense. It, it felt very insecure. There was there was tear gas, there were helicopters, and I was in a, a space reserved for journalists that was invaded, and the mob just took all of the equipment and broke it. So this is something new, actually. I had been to uh, 
some of President Trump's rallies, where he points to to the media and says they're, they're, the media is there uh, and people point to us and they laugh at us. And I had seen that before, but that didn't feel as unsafe as it felt this time. Thanks very much. And and Jose, uh, what what did you what did you see? Um, do you feel the same that this is uh, that this is maybe a new face of America, or is this perhaps? Uh, uh, just an aberration. Hopefully, the Trump moment will pass. I would say two things. On the first, uh, uh, first, I would I would say that continuously during the election, during the campaign itself, it was I was making a very, a very conscious effort to tell my readers that uh, Trump voters were regular Americans who had some grievances legitimate in the political process and they had been left out and that for some reason or another uh, he was been, he has been able to present them and portray them in a way that uh, became mainstream. I didn't want during my reporting during the campaign to transmit to my readers that Trump voters were some weirdos, wackos, crazy people who you know were mostly racist. But what we saw last week at the Capitol were these elements from the fringe right extremism, extremist types that crystallized exactly the many of the stereotypes that people outside of the US had of the Trump voters. I think it's important to make that distinction because Trump voters are not all these crazy types that we saw in television with the fur heads and everything. So, but it's but it's true that uh, the events crystallized that image that the ex- that extremists could take over at some moments in, in political his- in, in the political history of the U.S. with dangerous consequences. Second, I would say that perhaps the most of the the people most surprised with what happened are Americans themselves. I would say that because uh, many people in the intelligentsia outside America understand that this image of the U.S. democracy as something perfect and, you know, the uh, shiny city and on the hill, it was part of American nationalism that was tried to be projected also above. But we all know that uh, the, the U.S. democracy was imperfect. We all know the, the troubled history of slavery, segregation in the U.S. that didn't guarantee political uh, rights for many people in the U.S. So I would say that uh, for many in the te- intelligentsia in Mexican circles, it was just uh, another uh, an example of how U- uh, how U.S. Uh, how the U.S. public was discovering that the democracy was also uh, with some failures. So, oh, Rafael, what? How was your? Uh, what's your take on this? I, I do agree with what Pepe was just saying about you know the followers of President Trump. You know, I, I talked to a lot of people during the campaign that were nothing like what we saw on the Capitol uh, last week. You know, these are just like moderate conservative Americans who want small government. Uh, they don't like regulation. They don't like high taxes. They don't like that abortion is legal. They don't like that you know Democrats want to increase uh, uh, controls on, on guns. They pretty much want a small government out of their lives. And they felt that Trump was the better fit for the political preferences. Now, I do believe that Donald Trump lost the election, but Trumpism, his political brand, the movement that he created four years ago, is very much alive. And is going to continue to be a very strong political force in the United States for many decades, for many years to come. Um, I don't know how long, but I don't think that Trumpism is going to go away because Trump is going to leave the White House. I don't think Trump is going to go away. I think he's going to try to remain a very relevant political actor in the United States. Now, I do think that the United States has a lot of trouble to come to terms with this. Um, And what we saw last week in the Capitol, I believe is a reflection of that. You know, the, the fact that no one saw the possibility of violence that the police was completely unprepared to deal with the most radical elements of the uh, of the Trump movement. I think partly, partly, it's because no one thought that something like that could happen in the United States. 
I think this is uh, it's it's very important that the United States realizes that now Trumpism it's part of the U.S. political landscape that is going to remain in the U.S. political ecosystem, and that it cannot be addressed just like something of, of, of a glimpse, something that's just like, it's just a like four-year mistake. No, Trumpism was in the making before Trump arrived, and Trumpism will survive, uh, you know, after Trump leaves the White House. Alejandro, I want to bring you in on the same question. Trump, Trumpism, lasting or an aberration? I think that the key question here is how strong will be the social support uh, uh, of Trump. Uh, and I think, uh, is there more Trumpism than Republicanism? And how Trump will connect with the uh, American people uh, in the near future? I think uh, that uh, will be the, the, the key question for the, for the Biden administration too, because the, the challenge for, 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 the Biden, for, for Biden is to restore, to be able to restore the confidence and the credibility of the democratic institution in the United States. And in this way, the, the big dilemma for Biden will be how to uh, be accountable the, the Trump era. No, how, how do you want to be to mend a, a, a message that the Trump era is going to be accountable? Because you have to respect the rule of law and send a message for the future uh, president of the United States. And this way, it could polarize more the country. And in the other hand, you have to unite the country. The, the message that Biden has sent all uh, 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 in, in different occasions that he will be the president of all the Americans. And uh, uh, this is a a, a thin line. How how do you going to manage this uh, two two path? No. How you going to unite the country and how you going to uh, be accountable accountable uh, at an administration like Donald Trump? And I think this is going to be the a key issue in in the in the near future for the the United States. And if you add to that. The, the 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 China and how the the, the 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 political discourse of Trump is very popular. It's not it's not a, 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 an easy task for Biden to connect with a a, a, a discourse and that is very rational uh, against a discourse of Trump who is very passionate. Sadly, we're going to have to leave it there because of uh, time. But uh, let me just say it's been a fascinating discussion. Um, first of all, it's clear that your newspapers and your countries have uh, top-notch journalists here in D.C. So uh, congratulations to you for that and, and for your understanding of the American political system. It's not always a, an easy political system to explain to, uh, to, to a foreign audience, but you guys clearly do a great job. Uh, second of all, thanks for... Uh, um, for, for sharing your, your opinions, not just about uh, the U.S. politics, but about perceptions of the U.S. in the region. Uh, with that, I'm going to turn it over to, uh, to our host, uh, John Maluski. John? Thank you, Duncan. Terrific conversation. Thanks to everyone involved. That was really outstanding. And uh, to our listeners, hope you enjoyed it as much as we did and that you will be back for another edition of America's 360. Until then, for all of us at the Wilson Center, I'm John Maluski. Thanks for joining us. You have been listening to America's 360, a podcast about the innumerable ties among the nations of the Western Hemisphere. America's 360 is produced and edited by Oscar Cruz, Angela Robertson, and Mariana Sanchez Ramirez. You can subscribe wherever you listen to your favorite podcasts. To learn more about our programs, please visit WilsonCenter.org. And please join us again next time for another episode of America's 360.